All right, welcome. In this video, we're going to look at the relationship between asymptotes on the graph of a function and limits. So I'm showing you the graph of g of x equals 1 over x, where x is greater than 0. And the main question we're looking at today is what is the meaning of those arrows? Now, you've been working with functions like this long enough that you really you know what it means. Okay, That arrow that's going up towards you know y equals 5, that's showing you that the graph is going to continue increasing and somehow it's not going to cross that y-axis. We've seen this in pre-cal or in algebra 2. Okay, so we've got these arrows here, and you know, I, I made them larger off to the side, um, and really these are getting at the idea of the asymptote. Okay, so the vertical asymptote, that's the thing I've boxed in blue, and the horizontal asymptote is you know, what you're seeing in red. Okay. And, but, you know, the whole point here is we're trying to connect the idea of the asymptote to the limit. So let's just write a limit statement as best we can, even if we don't know exactly what it means quite yet. Okay, thinking about the vertical asymptote, what is x approaching? It looks like, you know, it's moving to the left, the arrow, a little bit. Not really, but okay, it's like x is approaching 0. Uh, but since we're only looking at one side of this graph, maybe I'll say x is approaching 0 from the positive side. And as that happens, 1 over x gets larger and larger. And we have experience with this. You, know, you divide by a smaller number, you get a larger quotient. Okay, so when that happens, it just gets larger and larger, and we're going to say that that limit is positive infinity. Okay, and that is going to be all right. That's really, it's going to be the only time it's going to be all right to say anything's equal to infinity in this course, but it will be okay. And we'll have a definition for that down below. Okay, and the thing that we can see from the limit statement that makes us know that we're looking at a vertical asymptote is the fact that the limit is infinity, right? Because so we're looking at the output values of the function. They're getting larger and larger. They're going towards infinity. And on the horizontal asymptote, okay, well, that's moving farther and farther to the right. You know, it looks like while staying above the x-axis. Okay, so x is getting larger without bound x is approaching positive infinity. And as that happens, 1 over x, you know, this is also something we have experience with, you take a 1 and you divide it by a larger and larger number, uh, the result you're left with, the quotient, is going to be smaller and smaller. It's going to get closer to 0. And that is the y-coordinate of the x-axis, so I'll point that out too. Okay, and we know that if we look at a limit statement that we're talking about a horizontal asymptote if we see the limit as x approaches infinity, or possibly negative infinity. Okay, now here you'll see the definitions we're going to take for these things uh, in, at the AP calculus level. Uh, this is actually a little bit closer to the real definition of limit than what we took yesterday, um, which was really just like, okay, if the two one-sided limits exist and agree, then the limit exists. Okay, for this, we'll say that the limit as x approaches infinity of f of x equals l, as in like, you know, we're approaching a horizontal asymptote of y equals l, if we can make output values of f of x be arbitrarily close, as close as you like to that limit l, by taking sufficiently large x values. Okay, and then for a vertical asymptote, we'd say that the limit as x approaches c of f of x, I got probably from one side, is equal to positive infinity if we can make the output values of f be arbitrarily large, you know, as big as you want by taking x values sufficiently close to c. And I'll show you what I mean here in a second by that. And I'm just going to throw in a disclaimer. Also, yeah, we could definitely make similar descriptions of one side limits and limits to negative infinity. All right, so back to the idea of g of x equals 1 over x. How could we guarantee that g of x is less than 0 0.01? So think about the horizontal asymptote. How can we get that close to the x-axis? You know, within 0 0.01, well, g of x, we've got a formula for that. We can do a little bit of analysis. That would be like asking, when is 1 over x less than 0 0.01? Well, 0 0.01, that's a fraction. We know that one. That's 1 over 100. And 1 over x would be less than 1 over 100 if x was greater than 100 for sufficiently large x values. As long as the x value is big enough, as in bigger than 100, we can make g of x less than 0 0.01. And could you make g of x less than that very, very small number right there? Uh, yes, you definitely could, because we know that we can make 1 over x as small as we like by taking sufficiently large x values. But since that's just a yes or no question, I'm just going to answer that yes.
Hey, then, you know, kind of in the vertical asymptote realm, how could we guarantee that g of x was greater than 51? And I am really struggling to remember why I chose 51 when I made these, you know, a few months ago, but uh, there it is. It says greater than 51. Well, okay, let's do the same process. 1 over x is greater than 51, and we can make that happen, just provided that x was less than 1 over 51. Um, and, you know, for ease of discussion, maybe also greater than 0. Okay, so if that happens, yeah, we've got 1 over x being greater than 51. Like if x is 1 over 100, 1 over x would be 100 over 1. Okay, so that would be definitely hitting the mark. So if x is in that interval 0 to 1 over 51, then g of x will be greater than 51. And if I wanted to make g of x greater than 10 to the 1,000, that's a really large number. But, you know, if I did want to make that happen, I'm sure I could just by choosing x, you know, between 0 and 1 over that number. So we'll just say yes. All right. And before we, you know, move on too far, these are a few important infinity-related limits. Um, I guess some more important than others. Like you see that first one, uh, we just talked about it, but this one is really important. That as x gets really large, 1 over x is going towards 0. Okay, because you're dividing by a larger and larger number while the numerator stays constant. Okay, uh, limit of natural log x as x approaches infinity. Okay, this one is going to be positive infinity. And I've got kind of two different reasons for you to think about this. Okay, on the one hand, think about what natural log of x is. Okay, it's the special exponent that I put on e to get x. Okay, and you know, if I'm taking the limit as x approaches infinity, what special exponent do I put on e to get e to the x, uh, or pardon me, e to that power um, as big as that arbitrarily large x? And there's no way that you can put e to one special power and get infinity or some arbitrarily large number. You're gonna have to take a really large exponent. Or you could think about the graph of y equals log x. Saw that definitely last year, whatever class you took. And this is the type of uh, graph, it does not have a horizontal asymptote. It just continues to grow. I mean, it really levels off, but it does grow. Um, and that's what we're talking about when we think the limit as x approaches infinity. Um, that's, is there a horizontal asymptote? And, you know, there is not on this one. So the limit is positive infinity. As x approaches negative infinity, e to the x goes towards zero. And this one I've also got two reasons for. On the one hand, think about x being a large negative number, like negative 100. Okay, e to the negative 100, that's equal to 1 over e to the positive 100, which would be like a really close to zero number. So the more negative the exponent gets, the closer e to the x gets to zero. But you could also look and say, okay, x is approaching negative infinity. Is there a horizontal asymptote out to the left? Yes, the graph is getting closer to the x-axis. That's why y is getting closer to zero. Okay. And then lastly, for limit of sine x as x approaches infinity, this one does not exist due to oscillation, right? Because we're looking at does the graph of this function get closer and closer and closer to one particular x value? And that's not the case of what happens there with, with sine x. So let's do a quick multiple choice example. If the function g is continuous at all x, which you don't exactly know what that means yet, but maybe you have an idea, and the limit of g as x approaches infinity is 4, which of these must be true? Okay, now one thing I'm hopefully, that's the reason I showed it to you, I want you to be able to eliminate a out of hand immediately because it's saying that g of 4 equals infinity, and infinity is not a real number, so how could g of 4 be equal to that? Okay, so we're going to get rid of that, because that's just not even, a, not even a valid mathematical statement. Okay, then let's kind of take that limit of g of x as x approaches infinity equals 4 and unpackage it in such a way that we can maybe make sense of it. Okay, x is approaching infinity. Okay, so um, that's a picture of x approaching infinity. And the graph of g is getting closer and closer to 4. Okay, so that would be like a horizontal asymptote. Okay. And so, okay, that is a horizontal asymptote. It's not a vertical asymptote. So I'm going to get rid of answer choices d and e. Okay, but then I'm going to look and say, okay, what's the difference between b and c? Oh, x equals 4 and y equals 4. And maybe you're like, oh, I remember that from algebra 2 at the very beginning of the class. I was kind of bad at that. Okay, this is not a big deal. Um, I just want you to be able to convince yourself of what the right answer is. So what you should do is think about that asymptote, that dotted line. Okay, think about all those points. What do they have in common? They've all got different x-coordinates, 
but they've got the same y coordinate. They're all having that y coordinate of four. So I'm gonna take that information and say, okay, the line y equals four is a horizontal asymptote to the graph of g, bubble in answer choice b, or select it on the computer these days, and you know, move on with our lives. So before we move on to vertical asymptotes, I'm going to ask you, you know, do you know how to find the horizontal asymptotes of a rational function and tra translate those into limit statements? Because that is something that we did cover in AP Pre-Cal last year. Now, I'm not assuming that every person that's taking this calculus class took AP Pre-Cal the previous year, um, but you might come in with a little bit of uh, prior knowledge about this. So I'm just going to kind of look closer at F. Um, I'm going to say what we did last year was we took the leading terms and divided them. And I'll be honest, it seemed a little illegitimate to me at the time, but I've done a little more investigation, and I see why that was the kind of a semi-legitimate thing to do in that class. So we isolate the x divided by x to the 3, we divide those, and that's equal to 1 over x squared. Okay, so the end behavior of f is the same as the end behavior of 1 over x squared. Okay. which is to say there is a horizontal asymptote of y equals zero because the bigger x gets, you know, one over x squared gets closer to zero and so does f. Okay, and I'm going to be showing you a reason why this is valid here in a moment. Okay, but if the horizontal asymptote is y equals zero, then we're going to be able to say that the limit statement is that the limit of f of x is equal to zero as x approaches plus or minus infinity. But, you know, in case you were wondering, like, wait, why is it legitimate for me to just go grab those lead terms? Like, the whole talk of, like, oh, it's just growing so much faster than the others. That's uh, kind of unconvincing. Uh, I would just show you this. Okay, it has to do with, like, dividing through by the greatest power in the denominator. Um, and I'm going to do this on each of the other ones also to, show, to kind of show you what's going on. Um, but algebraically, you can look at this. I, I'm not going to talk you through it or anything, just in the interest of time. Um, and also because it's not something you're expected to do on a given limit in this class. You are fully free to look at this f of x. If you're asked the limit as x approaches infinity, you're fully free to say equals zero with no justification. I'm going to look at h of x next because that's just like... This one and the previous one are the two that we are much more likely to see in AP Calculus than the one that's in the middle. I feel like the one in the middle, that's more of a pre-cal concern, and we might just be able to leave it back behind us there. Okay, so for h of x, we're going to grab the leading terms, 2x squared divided by x squared, take them off to the side, divide them, and get 2. Okay, so that means that y equals 2 is going to be the horizontal asymptote, and the limit statement would be like, okay, the limit of h of x as x approaches positive or negative infinity is equal to 2. But again, you know, in case you were wondering, like, wait, why is this legitimate? I would show you the reason right here. Once again, divide through by the highest power in the denominator. Notice that the fractions inside the fractions, those are going to zero because it's like three over x squared and two over x squared. And you can see it from there. Okay. In the middle, this g of x, um, it's got a power on top that exceeds the power on bottom, right? x to the 4 plus 2 grows faster than x to the 2 plus x plus 1. So this one's not going to have a horizontal asymptote. Is kind of what we maybe had said in the past. In AP Pre-Cal, oftentimes we were asked about like the actual limits as x approaches positive or negative infinity. So we would like, you know, kind of divide the leading co like not the coefficients, divide the leading terms, you know, see that it was x squared. That showed you a parabola. Um, you can see what we were going to say about that, you know, if we were going to do the exact same process in calculus. But I just don't think that's necessary for this course. And I, I like to think I'm pretty familiar with the, you know, the types of questions that you're you know, likely to see on the AP Calculus test. Okay, now let's move on and talk about some vertical asymptotes. Okay, we're going to find the values of the limits. And this is x is approaching 2 from the positive side. Now, in general, if you're confronted with a limit, it's like x is approaching some real number like 2. You should always start by plugging in that number and seeing what happens. If we do that on this one, we're going to get 10 divided by 0. And that is a sure sign of a vertical asymptote. So we're going to need to do some analysis. This is a one-sided limit. We, if it's a vertical asymptote, we know it's going to be approaching infinity or negative infinity. So if this is a multiple choice question, you can probably eliminate it down to infinity or negative infinity. Um, but we need a little bit more knowledge than that to make certain. Okay, so what we're going to do is say, okay, we're approaching 2 from the positive side, so that's to the right, something greater than 2, like 2.01. And then I'm going to plug in x equals 2.01 to the fraction and kind of see what happens. So I'm going to take 5 times 2.01, and I'm going to divide that by 2 minus 
And really, it's not important the actual values here, just whether they're positive or negative, because I know that 5 times 2.01 is a positive number, and 2 minus 2.01 is a negative number. If I take a positive and I divide by a negative, I'm going to get a negative. And all the while, I am approaching a vertical asymptote. And assuming there's no sign change in either the numerator or the denominator between 2 and 2.01, which there's not, um, I can see now that this, uh, that this fraction is tending towards negative infinity as x approaches 2 from the positive side. All right, here's one for you to try on your own if you want. Um, this one's a little bit different, you know, it's just the x, limit as x approaches 1 without a one-sided indicator, so you're going to need to be thinking about the limits from both sides. But if you're interested, this is one you should work with video pause, because I'm going to bring in the answers in a couple seconds. All right, there you go. So I think, you know, from both sides, I'm seeing positivity on this fraction. You know, if I plug in 1.1 or 0 0.9, um, as it's written originally, you could see that and be kind of <laughs> painstaking to do the arithmetic. Um, the key to this one, I think, is factoring the denominator and saying that, oh, x squared minus 2x plus 1, I can rewrite that as x minus 1 times x minus 1. And because it's a square in the denominator, well, that's why from either side, the denominator is going to be positive. And this type of function is actually always going to be positive, right? Because the numerator is positive, the denominator is a square. So this one is going to be always positive. While it's approaching vertical asymptote, it must be approaching positive infinity. Right. Now, if you're asked to just find the vertical asymptotes of a function, here's a function, find its vertical asymptotes. Uh, what you're probably going to want to do is just grab the denominator and set it equal to zero, because that's the cause of a vertical asymptote, is you know, division by zero. Maybe with a little bit of fine print in there. But, you know, we grab the denominator, we set it equal to zero, we go do some factoring. It's like, we've got this. Okay, it looks like x equals 2 and x equals negative 1. These are equations of vertical lines. It looks like everything's great. Okay, but look at the numerator. The numerator is also factorable, and it's going to have a common factor. Okay, so not both of these will end up being vertical asymptotes. If we grab the numerator and we factor out that greatest common factor of x, we are left with x times x squared minus 4. We factor the x squared minus 4. We get x plus 2 and x minus 2. It's like, uh-oh, there it is. Common factor of x minus 2. So if I was to write these as a fraction, those would cancel off. And as a result, I know that x equals 2 is actually the location of a hole in the graph of y equals f of x, not a vertical asymptote. So I'm going to get rid of that be like, oh, whoops, big mistake. That was actually a hole, not a vertical asymptote. So the vertical asymptote of f is going to be at x equals negative 1. For g, once again, I would encourage you to try this on your own. You know, find the zeros of the denominator. Make sure they're not also zeros of the numerator. Um, but if you're going to do that, work that with a video pause because I'm going to bring in the answers here in a moment. Okay, so I guess it was just one answer. Um, I took the denominator, I set it equal to zero. Uh, you know, even the highlighted equation that I wrote in black, uh, 1 minus e to the 5x equals zero. If you can solve that with your eyes and you can see that x equals zero, I totally encourage you to do that. Um, but if you want to add e to the 5x to both sides, you can even take a natural log of both sides and then divide by 5 to convince yourself that x equals zero. But x equals zero will be the vertical asymptote of this function. Okay, now that we've talked about all that, I need to also tell you about relative growth rates when comparing like two different classes of function. So, you know, one thing that we never really addressed last year was what happens to a function like x divided by e to the x. You know, if you have power on one side of the fraction and exponential on the other, or power and log, or sine and log, or something like that. And that's something that we need to be able to answer in AP Calculus. So I think I'm going to just remind you that the same principles that you saw in your algebra class or your pre-calculus class still apply. That a faster growing fraction, or a fraction that's numerator is growing faster than its denominator is going to approach infinity over time. Uh, a fraction whose denominator is growing faster than its numerator will approach zero. And if the numerator and denominator are growing at the same rate, uh, then the uh, fraction itself is going to tend towards some ratio that is generally the ratio of leading coefficient, coefficients. Okay. But in this case, we're really talking about, you know, like comparing different types of functions, not necessarily the leading coefficients thing. So the three main types of functions that we're going to deal with here that are growing are going to be exponentials, powers, and log. Okay, and within each of these, you know, there's kind of like different 
growth rates within them. Okay, for exponentials, uh, I think it makes sense that 10 to the x would grow faster than 3 to the x, which would grow faster than 2 to the x, which would itself grow faster than 1.01 to the x. I would remind you that because e is between 2 and 3, the e to the x would just pop right in there in terms of like the uh, speed of growth. Um, we've got an example like this coming up in a minute. I feel like I had something else to say about exponentials. Oh, you know, an exponential with base less than one, uh, that would be exponential decay, and that would just not be written in the most efficient way, and that's not what we're talking about right here. Okay, for powers, these are like x to some number. Okay, so, you know, we've got x to the 10 growing faster than x to the 2, growing faster than x, growing faster than the square root of x. And I am saying here that 1.01 to the x, the slowest growing exponential, does eventually grow faster than the fastest growing power function. So 1.01 to the x, yes, does grow faster than x to the 999. Okay, I'll be able to show you why that's true, eh, let's say, in about a month and a half. Um, once we learn about L'Hopital's rule. And then underneath all of these, the slowest growing function of all the ones that we know in this class is going to be log. And really, you know, the, you've seen there are different bases of logs, like there's different types of logs. But in this class, we are only interested in natural log. And oh yeah, I was supposed to point out that uh, square root x, you know, that's definitely growing slower than regular x because that's, you know, x to the 0 0.5 versus x to the 1. And, you know, you could even have cube root in there too, and that's x to the 1 third. And I'll just let you think about what that means. Means. Okay, and then I need to probably also off to the side point out that there are some functions that don't grow at all, like, you know, say a constant function that just stays always the same, or also a sinusoidal function because that's not really growing, it's just like kind of increasing and decreasing and increasing and decreasing, so something like sine x or cosine x, those things aren't really growing. And I think these six right here are kind of exactly what I'm talking about. Like log x versus square root x as x approaches positive infinity. Okay, we know that log is the slowest growing thing we have. So that means that square root x grows faster. The denominator is growing faster. We say that limit equals zero. For x to the three divided by natural log x, once again, log x is the slowest thing we have. And x to the three grows faster. So the numerator is growing faster than the denominator. I'm gonna say this limit is positive infinity. And I'm gonna be confident about the fact that it's positive infinity because the numerator and denominator are both positive when x is a very large number. Okay, then for the next one, two to the x versus x to the 100. I mean, you just look at it and it looks like, oh man, the denominator is growing much faster but it's not, the numerator's exponential. And so since it's growing faster on top, this one's approaching positive infinity. Once again, if you think about when x is a large positive number, which it would need to be as x approaches positive infinity, x to the 100 and two to the x will both be positive. And I guess it's actually true that both two to the x and x to the 100 will be positive. Um, really for any x, x to the 100 would be zero if x was zero, but otherwise, you know, it's an even power, so it'll always be positive. And two to the x is an exponential with positive base, so that must also be positive. Okay, down in the bottom left, we've got sine x, which does not grow at all, versus x in the denominator. So I've got a number that's kind of oscillating between negative 1 and 1, dividing by something that's getting larger and larger and larger, that's going to go towards 0. Okay. And then the next one, this one could be a little tricky, right? There's both exponential. I could see, you know, a person choosing an answer choice of like, say, two-thirds on this one. Um, that would be understandable. But remember, 3 to the x does grow faster than 2 to the x, so this one would equal 0. And I might come back with another example here in a second in contrast to that. Uh, but then 1 plus sine of 1 over x as x approaches infinity. You just got to think about the fraction first. What's happening with the x? Okay, x is approaching infinity, so 1 over x goes towards 0. And that means that I'm taking 1 plus the sine of a number that's getting really close to 0. And we know that sine of 0 is equal to 0. So this limit is going to equal 1 plus 0, which is 1. Okay. Now if I was to kind of zoom in on this one a little bit, and let's see, yeah, no, I'm, I can see all that. Um, I might point out that this is different from the limit as x approaches infinity of 2 e to the x plus 3 divided by 4 minus 5 e to the x, or something like that. Okay, as x approaches infinity, I've got these, you know, e to the x's right here, and those are growing at the same rate, and so then we would divide their leading co or their yeah their coefficients, and so that would be equal to two over negative five in that case. All right, this has kind of been a long one, but I've got a couple more things to tell you. It shouldn't take too long though. Um, both of them kind of just trivia facts. First one is 
you can have two horizontal asymptotes to the graph of a function. And now if you looked at the graph of y equals inverse tangent of x last year in your trigonometry class, you may have seen that, you may have noticed it. But you may have seen the graph and not even noticed or forgotten that it was possible. And I'm going to show you why it's possible kind of algebraically. So we're going to show that the graphs of these functions have two horizontal asymptotes by considering both the limit as x approaches infinity and negative infinity. But I'm going to start with the one on the right with g of x. This 2 e to the x plus 3 divided by 4 minus e to the x. I think it's actually easier to see what's going on with this one. So first we're going to consider the limit as x approaches positive infinity. Just like I just showed you. I kind of regret doing that. I see that now that might have been actually my plan when I made these notes. Uh, 2 e to the x plus 3 over 4 minus e to the x. The fastest growing thing I see is the e to the x. So I would take the ratio of the leading coefficients. That would be 2 over negative 1. And so I'm seeing that if the limit is negative 2, then y equals negative 2 must be a horizontal asymptote to the graph of this function. Okay, then if I consider the limit as x approaches negative infinity, okay, well, ah, this is a situation where e to the x goes towards 0. I showed you that earlier in this video. Okay, so 2 times a thing that's getting really close to 0 plus 3. Okay, I'm getting close to 0 plus 3 divided by 4 minus 0. And since that limit is 3 fourths, we can see that y equals 3 fourths will also need to be a horizontal asymptote to the graph of g. Okay, now f. This one with the square root of x squared plus 1. I always ask in my class, what does x, uh, the square root of x squared mean to you? And everyone says x. And it's like, yes, usually. But really, it's the absolute value of x. And I'm going to need that to show you why this uh, works the way it does. So if we look at this right here, this square root of x squared plus 1 over x minus 2. I'm just going to kind of do the same thing. Look at the limit as x approaches infinity. Um, you know, it's essentially the same, the square root of x squared. That's like about x and x. So I think it should track to 1 over 1, or at least the square root of 1 over 1, right? Had it been the square root of 9x squared plus 1, I'd have said it would probably 3 over 1. Okay, but that's not what we're seeing here. And as x approaches negative infinity, oh, well, I guess I could write out that that means y equals 1 is going to be a uh, horizontal asymptote. As x approaches negative infinity though, this thing is going to approach negative 1. And I think the easiest way to understand is that, well, if you take a number and you square it and you add 1, and then take the positive square root, which is what we mean when we, you see that square root symbol in ink written on the paper, it does mean the positive square root. If we take the positive square root of a positive number, we're going to get a positive number in the numerator, but as x approaches negative infinity, x minus 2 must be negative. So I've got a positive over a negative, so this must be approaching y equals negative 1. Now if that didn't really work for you, I'll show you some algebra right here, and I'll let you uh, kind of piece through that. It has to do with you know the fact that the square root of x squared is actually the absolute value of x, and you need to remember that uh, or x divided by the absolute value of x function that we looked at the graph of in the previous lesson, hey, but that's something that you could see right there. Um, if you were interested in why this was true. Alright, so we've pretty much made it to the end of these notes. I'm not doing the extra examples in this video. I'm almost at half an hour. I try to keep these videos to 20 minutes, but this is a very important lesson. Not necessarily because we're going to be like using this every day, but because it will come back from time to time throughout the course. It's going to come back when we do improper integration in January, and then when we go to do series in, in the spring, we'll be interested in limits. We'll be very interested in it. Okay, but uh, before I let you go, I do need to show you something. And this is not something you're going to be, you know, necessarily tested on, this limit definition of E right here. Um, but it's something that would be remiss of me not to mention as a calculus teacher. And since we just were talking about limits as, you know, something goes towards infinity, I figured now would be the appropriate time. E is the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 plus 1 over n to the nth power. And, you know, hopefully you were already aware of this, but uh, natural log of x is the value of t for which x equals e to the t. It's the special exponent we put on e to get x. All right, so I think that's all I've got for you for this video. That was a long lesson. If you made it this far, I really do appreciate it and I hope it helped. Thank you for watching.